Thank you. Um, see if I can do this. Okay. My um, experience with Celtic art, my exposure to it, really began in 1968 when my grandmother um, went on a trip to Ireland, Rome, and, and uh, Israel. And when she came back, she brought me this little souvenir book about the Book of Kells. And uh, this uh, it isn't actually it. This is a similar thing that was done later. And so I, I got this about August of, of 1968, and I was immediately uh, fascinated with it, the, the, the complexity and beauty of the designs, and, and um, you know, it, it really touched a chord with me. And just a few weeks after that, um, it was the beginning of the, of the fall school term. I went to, um, went to school and I met um, a couple of boys, uh, Rory and Kevin McCray, and uh, was invited to uh, uh, Kevin's 11th birthday party. And there was his father, who was a art teacher, William Scotty McCray. And this is on the left is about where he was. I'm going to take about five minutes to talk about, um, about Scotty because um, this, this conference is sort of dedicated to his memory. Uh, he passed away just a little while after the, um, the previous conference in Andover. But um, Scotty was at the end of his driveway painting on the uh, mailbox. And he was painting with thistles and some Elenseal letters, McCray, and, some, and a little flourish of, of interlace. And I thought, I know what this is. And you know, I was very excited about it. And then Kevin took me into the house where there's all this uh, sculpture. And I was, you know, I was already excited about Celtic art. Now here's a living uh, practitioner of it. Um, the McCray house was this old, old farmhouse. Uh, Scotty came from a um, Scottish family in um, Niagara Falls, New York. His, his ancestors were uh, Clarence Scots. Gaelic speakers who'd come over, and he was, uh, as a child during World War II, he was, his parents went off to do war service, and he was um, left with his great-grandmother and his grandmother and, and his great-aunt, and um, they owned some property in Alfred, New York, which is right near Andover, where I live, and they, his great-grandmother had bought this old house, which eventually became his home. And here he is with his um, um, his son as an infant and, and one of the older women of the family. But um, he, he got the name Scotty as a, a piper in the in the U.S. Navy during the during the Korean War. As a ship's piper, but he he really um, really enjoyed. This is this is Andover. He went to he came to Alfred, you know, because of this family connection to the home, and then. Um, went to Alfred University, got a, a design degree, and then became a teacher in Andover Central School, which is uh, right there. And my house is right like over there somewhere. My mother's house is way over here. <laughs> so uh, after this, this introduction, and I met a lot of other people that were very important to me that day. Um, it was really kind of a life-changing uh, day for me. But um, just a few weeks after that, my family, found a home that they wanted on a fall day much like this. There was some beautiful maple trees glowing in, in, in new foliage. So uh, this, this building right here, the old Methodist church, is where the previous uh, conference was held. Um, Scotty's art was, um, he, he, he did a lot of graphics and prints, but he, he did a lot of wood carving, and he, he did what he called assemblages, which were, um, different pieces of wood carved independently and then assembled together, um, telling a story, usually with sort of a medieval flair and quite often with some, uh, with some Celtic, uh, Celtic detail. And this, this influenced my own work quite a bit and that I do similar things with my jewelry quite often where I make things of different pieces that are assembled and, um, and that, um, you know, different colors of, of metal. Um, Scotty's been very big about passing on the, you know, the, the Scottish and Gaelic tradition that was handed down to him, to his children. Uh, these are the boys, probably a little before I met them, but um, 
his son Alec is also very good. This is Alec. He's a, I taught Alec to play bagpipes, and um, Alec um, is a very good woodcarver himself. I'm really sorry he couldn't be here today. But he has, uh, Scotty had two sons and then five grandsons, and now he's into the great grandchildren, um, some of which live in Andover. But here's, here's some of his uh, more recent work. And then in um, later years, he moved out of the big old house and built this new house. It's kind of like a Scottish croft house. And a lot of, uh, a lot of the house is detailed. It, his, his sons raise uh, Heeland coos. So it's a, it, it's a very picturesque place. Here he is with his wife. And, but in the center, here he's sitting there holding forth in conversation and, and, and imparting sage wisdom, which was really the way a lot of us, uh, a lot of us remember him. And um, I was telling my story, people come to Andover in my store and they say, well, why Andover? Why, the, why this Celtic stuff here? And I would tell them what I just told you. And it, in early 19, or 2018, I realized that, oh, this was 50 years ago, almost, excuse me, almost exactly. And um, I thought, we should, we should commemorate this. So we uh, put together a, an art exhibit of local, local artists and craftsmen who were influenced by Scotty, and, and we um, um, had it in, in my uh, uh, exhibition room in my shop. And this was on um, the 50th anniversary of me meeting Scotty, but we had nearly 50 people participating as exhibitors. And um, this whiskey we're using for toasting um, Danka's a little bit responsible for that. That whiskey has never been sold. It was uh, donated to the Insular Art Conference as a, um, for a whiskey reception, and there was a bottle left over, which uh, found its way into my bag afterwards. <laughs> so, because I did not take it, Danka put it there for me. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, speaking at the... Um, at the conference in, in 2019, this is where he was pictured. This was in, uh, well, around, uh, around June 9th. And um, he really um, spoke as he often did. And it was, it was kind of a, like a review of, of a lot of what he thought and what he's about Celtic art, and about um, you know, the continuation of Celtic culture in the New World. And uh, he passed away in October that year. Um, um, this monument was uh, one that he, with help of his family and friends, uh, crafted for his uh, his wife, who predeceased him by about about ten years. So anyway, I'm I'm very uh, grateful to have the opportunity to um, talk about uh, him for a few minutes and and remember him. His Talk at the previous conference is available on YouTube. If you go to YouTube and search on um, William Scotty McRae, you'll find it's about 40 minutes, 45 minutes or so. Anyway, the things we uh, say about Celtic art, um, you know, as artists and craftsmen, we want to create cultural value for what we make. We uh, owe it to our, our audience to have a good story. Scotty was a very very good story, but now when I say our audience, uh, that sounds a little better than, than calling them customers, a little less crass and commercial. So yes, a lot of what I'm, I'm going to talk about does, does involve marketing a little bit, because um, you know, we, th we think of Celtic art in terms of um, the sources that come down to us from the past, but um, the way that it was uh, presented in the 19th century and, and the way some of the um, new things that came out in the, in the 19th century were, were sold has a, it also affects how we, uh, you know, how we understand it or what, how we imagine it today. So um, it's, it's a given that the Celtic style is a, is a reference to the past and the past comes to us through stories and through surviving artifacts. And we imagine the foundation of our Celtic Renaissance are ancient objects, but what happened, um, you know, in the you know things like the Book of Kells or the Arda Chalice were a long time ago. And if we were to claim that this is a living tradition, as I'm sure 
this room is a great testament that it is a living tradition. I think we have to understand what's happened in more recent generations. And I'm, um, my suggestion is that a lot of what, what happened uh, in the uh, middle of the 19th century and into the early 20th century has a lot, a very lot to do with how we, uh, how we understand what we're doing now today. So, um, when I speak of folklore, I'm really talking about what people, what people say, what we, what, how we conversationally pass these things on, not how the learned uh, professors and, and uh, museum curators interpret it based on, you know, provable fact and, and evidence and things like that, but the things that have kind of, um, in some cases, are a little more optimistic or a little more, uh, a little more fun than, than, um, than, uh, than some of those. So there's really three, three sort of narratives to Celtic art um, that, I, that I consider the folklore or the, or, or the, um, the points that we're supposed to... Uh, um, I'm sure all of us have been, have been told this in our introduction to it. One of them is that the Celtic design is almost superhuman complexity, or imagination, uh, often expressed in this term, the work of angels. And this can often be um, um, imagined that it, it took a lot more than just practice, that it, it, you had to rise to a higher mental state to be able to do this. You had to have... Um, um, you know, years, years of druidic training or, or meditation or um, um, possibly hallucinogenic drugs to, uh, um, to, to, to attain this, this, um, this distortion of reality that, that uh, is, is presented. And, um, you know, we saw th this was a... In, before things were coming together with all these how-to-do-it, um, instructions, you know, methods of construction like George Bain or, or, um, or Michael's more recent book or Aiden, Aiden Meehan. Um, it was believed that uh, by many people, especially people that hadn't tried it, that you had to, you know, you had to have some like almost spiritual guidance. And you'd hear people, uh, Scotty used to talk, imagine that maybe something like automatic writing was happening, you know, kind of a more of a mystical spiritual experience. Um, the other second um, section of the, of the um, folklore is that it's all, all native, that it's all something that is, you know, Ireland and Scotland were never invaded by the Romans. They were, um, the golden age of Celtic art was before uh, the Anglo-Norman invasion. And therefore, um, this, is, this is something that's, that's um, nationalistic and, and, uh, and uh, you know, the essence of, of, of the people. And the, the third thing is that there's a deep and mysterious symbolism in every detail, often expressed as each knot has a meaning. And, and, and many of us have been kind of awkwardly had to answer, well, can you tell me what this means? And, and um, well, um, these, these things are, were all discussed quite extensively in the um, early days of, of, um, of archaeology becoming respectable. Um, uh, Etienne Wren wrote uh, in one of his articles that prior to about 1840, uh, archaeology seemed to be uh, uh, the, the province of, of the uh, lunatic fringe or near lunatic fringe. And, and you, we do get a lot of, um, you know, very much imagined, imagined um, um, interpretations of, of discoveries. But uh, one of the first um, um, serious scientific, uh, scientifically minded archaeologists was uh, Sir David Wilson. And uh, he wrote this book in, in um, 1851. And David Wilson was like a lot of these people. He was a very good artist. I mean, th these... Um, this render, whoops, yeah, we're gonna go back there. This rendering of the um, of the Hunterston brooch was was his own drawing, but um, he he made the observation in terms of like survival and being a native thing that this tradition of interlaced ornamentation had survived from ancient times right down to the 
to the uh, time of the Jacobite uprising and the Battle of Culloden. And he also talks about um, the three-cornered knot, you know, the triquetra as being a a symbol of the Holy Trinity. He discusses that in his book. Um, But he, uh, as he's talking about, you know, this later manifestation, uh, I have a brooch here we can pass around. Could you pass this around, please? I know it's kind of dark, but it's, uh, I didn't bring the dirk. That's a part of my collection also. But uh, towards the end, I mean, this was already being used as like a, um, at, at this point in, um, you know, early modern times as, as, a, as being symbolic of, of, or being emblematic, I guess we should say, of, um, of you know, of the culture, of the people. And, um, of course, the Jacobite uh, uh, movement drew very heavily on um, Scottish um, sense of, of, of their own separate heritage from the English. Uh, one of the things I really love about this dirk is that the interlace um, is, is really wrong in, in many ways. And I think that the reason for this um, is because at the time, there was a, a, an increased demand for it. People wanted this kind of thing. It was, um, you know, it's a weapon, so it's associated with the rebellion, but it's, um, there probably weren't enough people that really knew how to do it right, but so they just did the best they could. And actually, the interlace on the brooch is, is kind of similar. Most of us would probably uh, do it a little better than that. So, um, And... Um, here, here's some sculptural examples from that same later period, you know, previous, previous to the Jacobite movement, but um, these are things from the West Highland School. Uh, there, but these illustrations are from the, the, the same period as archaeology is getting serious about examining these things. And quite a, one of the themes in a lot of these books is that this stuff has been neglected too long. And in the previous generations, say the late ninth. Uh, Late 18th century, early early 19th century, a lot of the illustrations were were pretty bad. Uh, George Bain covers some of them, but at this time, at the same time that the um, you know archaeology is coming out, there, there's sort of a commercial exploitation of it, and um, objects like this. Here's another brooch to pass around. <laughs> um, and this is the one that's uh, being illustrated here. This was the um, a, the cabin brooch, of course. The the original medieval one was, you know, seventh or eighth century, or possibly even a little earlier. Um, but it was being reproduced in Dublin by West and Company in 1849, and it was being done uh, actually using the highest technology of the time. It was um, this is an electrotype which is a way you make a mold and then you deposit metal from a, a solution. It's like electroplating, except you're electroplating into the mold and building up thick layers, and then you solder the two, two halves together. So this is, this is pretty much like the um, 19th century version of a 3D printer would be today. And um, sometimes this is referred to as the queen's pattern brooch because they gave... Um, gave one of these to Queen Victoria when she visited uh, Dublin in, in 1849. Um, she also um, notoriously autographed the Book of Kells in 1849, which drew more attention to the Book of Kells than it probably had ever previously had, um, because you know the, the visit was covered in, in mass media. It was, it was in the uh, London Illustrated News, and people all around the world were, were learning about the Book of Kells as they read about this celebrity visit. Now, uh, this excitement about uh, historic, you know, antiquarian objects and and new recent uh, archaeological discoveries is the, um, what's known as the Tara brooch, although it was nowhere near Tara. Um, It is, um, this was discovered in 1850 and was being manufactured by George Waterhouse, the firm of, of Waterhouse and Company in, in Dublin, the same year. 
and they were exhibiting it at the, the Crystal Palace Exposition in London in, in 1851. So they were using, again, the highest technology available at the time to, to make dyes to stamp these, these things. And um, I've got one of those to pass around, too. They're, they made thousands of them. I mean, they're, they're quite collectible, but they're... Uh, they're um, and you can kind of pass these to the back, and my wife will uh, collect them. There's going to be three, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> um, yeah, I brought my roadies here to enforce this. So nobody can leave until we've got three. <laughs> so, um, so anyhow, um, these were promoted brilliantly. I mean, they, they were sold in urban department stores. They were... Um, you know, advertised in magazines and print, mass media, exhibited in world's fairs, um, and they were a, very much a commercial success. And what they, what they said about them was probably, you know, well, George Petrie did, gave a great paper to the Royal Irish Academy about the, um, the tar brooch after he'd had a chance to exhibit it, uh, examine it, although Waterhouse owned it himself for the next 20 years. But as... Um, Probably what he said about it had less of an influence on the popular perception of this stuff than, um, than what Waterhouse had to say about it. As if what Petrie said had less influence than what, what Waterhouse did. And what he was telling us, you know, this is a great symbol, um, status symbol that the, the princes and chieftains of, of uh, ancient Ireland would, would wear. So now another artist author is uh, Henry O'Neill who is most famous for his um, book on the high crosses. He did a, uh, a book with uh, 36, 36 uh, lithographs. And he was also very much associated with the Young Ireland Movement, which was, uh, the, the Young Ireland Movement was really focusing quite a lot on, on um, art as a uh, um, evidence of, of Ireland's sophistication in, in former times. So um, there was a, you know, the, the, there was a little bit of a, of a political and propaganda um, agenda going on with, with a lot of this. Uh, Henry O'Neill wrote th four books. I think only three of them ever made it to completion. They all had Ireland in the title. And um, his, his, book on uh, crosses did something that I think is really significant in that he did a lot of these exploded views where he just showed a detail. And um, you know, we've all seen books like this where the a single detail is taken out and looked at. And, if you, and I think that this, pers this um, skews people's idea of it a little bit because you see a certain single piece and you, th you think of that as maybe uh, looking more like a symbol than if it's just part of the overall overall program, but that's a little side for now, but, um, yeah, oh, sorry, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, um, he wrote a book on the um, fine arts and civilization of Ireland, and um, he had very little to say about uh, symbolism, other than say that the cross was a symbol, which obviously it is. He, he didn't use the word Celtic very much either. To him, this was Irish. Everything was Irish. He was, he was very much... Uh, his, his third book, which was not about art, was, um, was a poli Ireland for the Irish, I think was the title of it. And it was, um, you know, it was a proposal of a, of a you know, political solution. But um, if you... you know, the, the first thing is, okay, Irish art has not had that much attention, but, it, it, but it's excellent. You know, pretty much all the books that were coming out to inform people of, of uh, Celtic art or Irish art at the time were, would, would really emphasize how unique and, and, um, and sophisticated and beautiful it was. And then, I'd, you know, we've all heard how the Celtic cross is pagan. You know, it has pagan origins. Well, I've been looking and looking, uh, trying to find out how far does that concept go back? What's the earliest citation you can find? Actually. Henry O'Neill's writing. I think it was probably around a little before that. Um, but, um, you know, the, the peculiar form of the Irish cross is heathen, and it was a sacred symbol to the pagans. Um, he really, he really um, 
went overboard on this in both in both of his books. And then this other thing that the Irish art must have been cultivated for centuries um, before the Book of Kells could have been produced is unquestionable in his mind. And it, it must have uh, existed for hundreds of years before Christianity. And this is a, you know, it's a very common um, point of view. Although if you go to the Insular Art Conferences, you know, picking everything apart and, you know, this, this is from here and there. This is a good example of um, one of the forms of evidence. I mean, this is a very old piece. It's a, a cross within a circle. And uh, things like this were um, uh, believed to be sun symbols and, and offered as, um, as a, uh, you know, in support of this idea of the cross, Celtic cross being a pagan, um, pagan thing. Um, this is the most um, famous of Henry O'Neill's images. Uh, this is from his, his book on high crosses. Uh, Henry O'Neill kind of fell out of favor with, um, you know, with the mainstream um, under, you know, scholarship of, of um, you know, he had, a, he had a big feud with, with George Petrie. In fact, uh, his book on uh, art and culture had a chapter that was called uh, Dr. Petrie's Errors. So, <laughs> so uh, and, and that, that feud didn't go very well for poor Henry, so, but anyway, this, this, is, this piece, I think it's just because it's such a beautiful composition, was, um, has been reused many, many times, and I'm sure, I doubt if anyone here has seen the image for the first time. But one of the great things with modern technology is you can, you can colorize a black and white image and you can you know, fill in some of the details, so uh, we did a little... Uh, Little thing with that, so just uh, this guy here. <laughs> so anyway, um, this book here, which I'm, I'm holding a copy of, is uh, the Cromlech on Hoth, and this kind of breaks. This is a bit of a breakout piece, I believe, in terms of this this period, because this was created not so much as a of publication to inform you, but to, but as a beautiful object in in its own way. You know, you buy this is a this is a coffee table book, really. It's, this is this is a you know very beautiful thing. The covers, um, you know, nicely embossed and, and um, gilded, and then a lot of the detail is um, copied from the Book of Kells. It is really. Um, a collaboration between three people. Um, Samuel Ferguson was a poet. He was one of the first poets that really um, did a lot of work to popularize, translate the um, um, you know heroic cycle into um, into English. You know the old, old bardic tales, and um, and then it was also with drawings from nature by. Oops, we have this this monogram here, MS, which we know now is Margaret Stokes, and then notes on Celtic ornament, revised by George Petrie, revised by. That's a little little confusing, but if you think of the, these people, are all three different generations. They're, um, you know, it's kind of a wonderful uh, wonderful project. Um, it's pretty well understood that Margaret Stokes was. Um, trying to sort of downplay her role, you know, being identified as a woman for a serious project like this, it might not have been taken as seriously. Uh, although she was a very privileged person, her her father was um, um, Dr. William Stokes, who was very good friends with George Petrie. She had access to all this stuff, and and uh, later in life she became um, uh, Dr. Petrie's. Um, well, she took care of his papers after he died, finished a lot of his projects, edited things, and then by the time of her own death, she was um, um, recognized as, as possibly the leading expert of, of her generation. But um, this is her drawing from life of, of the Cromlech, or you know, also known as dolmens, or in those days they were often called uh, druid's altars. Um, because it's collapsed, it's maybe not quite as classic, but that's a, um, but here, here's the opening part of the, of the poem. And the poem is, it's about um, Oshin giving 
the the you know funeral ode to Aideen, the, the daughter of, of Angus, who has died of grief after her husband Oscar was killed in battle. And you can see as it goes down here, they're evoking um, you know the Dodonan Druids sleep in, in the landscape. And you see this letter T, as makes sense. And there's this column here of, uh, of interlaced figures, which um, if you might wonder, what does that have to do with, with what's going on here? Um, here is the um, Book of Kells source of these two things. And um, this says, if we could read Latin, it would say, um, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness uh, to be tempted by the devil. It's from the book of Matthew. And then this is, this is the letter B. It's B A two, B A two, B A two. Blessed are the poor in spirit. This is the Beatitudes. All on. There's eight Beatitudes, just like there's eight stanzas in the um, in St. Patrick's breastplate. So if we compare these, um, I don't think it really has much to do with this at all, other than it is a, a beautiful uh, relic of, of the Irish past that's being used along with a couple of other things from the Irish past. The Cromlech itself is a very impressive monument, although they're from like 4000 BC, 4500 BC. Don't really know if they understood they were that old at that time. And then you've got this, uh, this um, literary you know, bardic tradition that's another, um, you know, culturally beautiful and important thing. So they're combining all these these uh, glories of the past into one object. And they're also doing something else that's kind of interesting. Um, if, I don't know if you can, how clearly you can read that, but if you, if you look, um, they're using the, um, okay, the love of ornament, it would seem, but it's got that long S that looks like the letter F. This style of, of typesetting had, gone out of use about 1805. You know, this is 60, 60 years after the, that kind of, this is an archaic way of doing it. Just one more way of making this look, uh, look older, you know, make this, make this uh, reference to the past. Another little interesting thing is, uh, there's a footnote here from Fraser's Magazine in August of 1862. Now the publication date was 1861, so this is, evidence of the Celtic uh, gift of clairvoyance. Right. <laughs> so, uh, now, um, the, the revised notes um, do address all three of the, um, the points of my, uh, where are we at here? Five minutes, okay. <laughs> um, there is the, the, you know, the triquetra, which he um, uh, discusses, but then you know, suggests that it's uh, um, you know, symbol of the Holy Trinity, native origin. Um, they go on about spirals more so than interlace and that. I think there's more solid evidence that certainly that is. It is, is agreed that it is uh, certainly true that that's a native thing. And then also uh, um, Gerald of Wales, um, his thing of it being a result of angelic rather than human skill. Now, uh, Romley Allen, who... Um, was writing around 18, or about 1900. He was very much a, a scientific about his approach, and uh, he, he expressed some doubt about the triquetra being a, a trinity symbol. But I can see that the, by the sh just the design of his book, people were tending to see, he had all these little breakout things here like this. And they, you know, if you, if you, if you didn't read this and study it, you just glance at it and you'd think, well, the, he's showing Maybe the you know these different things have some kind of different meaning, but because the triquetra was was um, seen as being a nameable symbol and all, and having a very specific uh, meaning, I think a lot of people jumped to the conclusion that all all these uh, little details had had similar similar um, similar meaning. But um, in Romley Allen did suggest that maybe on this one Pictish stone from Meagle, that maybe it was a, a Trinity symbol there. And I think the, his, his uh, 
argument is because it was on the symbol side of the stone rather than you know, on the more ornamental side where the cross is the major symbol. But um, a generation later, uh, Francoise Henri was um, suggesting that it was indeed a Trinity symbol here on this, uh, this stone from Donegal. But my own opinion, this is one of the only, this is probably the closest we have from ancient times of seeing it, um, seeing the triquetrus by itself. It's not completely by itself, but we never do really see it standing alone. But um, Archibald Knox, I think, really did something perhaps unintentionally in terms of ch shifting our ideas of how, how things worked and that his, um, you know, he's breaking these things free. He's sh showing very simple, simple, um, simple knots and um, his brooches are the shape of a knot. His jewelry is the shape of this, uh, what would be an ornament applied to something like the, the Tara brooch is, is the, uh, the piece itself. And worn that way, it looks more symbolic. And, and certainly people do that. Now, are we to see a Celtic Renaissance? What do you think? <laughs> so, um, again, uh, George Bain, he's, he's bringing the Druids back into it again. He's, he's sort of insinuating that the art was a Druidic thing. He was, I mean, he, he was less of a, he was an art teacher. He was, he was about the art. Okay, pretty close, huh? But, um, he, he kind of combined, um, you know, this is, this is carpet he did, sort of a sampler. You've got people here from, you know, the early medieval uh, Pictish period and then these sort of Jacobite guys and they're participating in the same activity. Um, what, what did you say we had left here? Zero? Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll quickly <laughs> flash through. <laughs> but Continuum was one of his big, uh, a big, you know, he was a champion of the idea that a continuous, uh, Continuous knots were, were were more important, and that, that the continuum, you know, the the idea of the eternity knot, or something like that. But if if you see the triquetra in more recent times being used as a piece of jewelry by itself, or in this case as an architectural detail, and um, not to turn this into a hostage situation, but this is a um, <laughs> keep you from your lunch. But um, this is a church in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where it's, it's clearly is being used as a, as a Trinity symbol there. And the idea, if it wasn't in medieval times, doesn't mean it can't be today, as well as other, other imaginative use. I'm um, all in favor of that. But in delving into this, um, this book, it says, this, indeed, the interlacing and plating so common in Celtic ornament seem to be an effort to express and create a sense of difficulty and something intricate yet not confused. In their entangled coils and infinite windings and their strange knotting and network, they form indeed fit symbols of the in inexplicable mystery of our faith and our life. And um, statements like these, I think, are, are um, you know, something that, that many of us may, may use. And this, uh, I, I have my own little commercial, as Danka did, was brought to you by <laughs> Walker's Celtic Jewelry. <laughs> So um, anyway, I thank you for uh, 